Hello and welcome to Keeping It Young Podcast, conversations about marriage, family, and ministry life. I'm Dave. And I'm Bethley. And we are the Youngs. And here we are still in the book of Proverbs. Yes, we are. And hope you've been enjoying this series. We've enjoyed all the feedback we've gotten from it. And today we are jumping into Proverbs chapter 3. We finished the, finally finished the theme of adultery and immorality that Solomon hammers over and over again. Yes. And uh, we're ready to move on and change our focus a little bit and uh, walks, go back. We're backing up. We finished in chapter 7 and we're backing up because we skipped some of the subjects in highlighting, kind of running with the theme for a little bit. We wanted to just have some continuity instead of, okay, let's talk about training children. Okay, let's talk about wisdom. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. And that's uh, interesting because Paul is so organized when he writes in the New Testament. He deals with doctrine, 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 and then he applies it, practice, practice, practice. Right. Solomon writes a little bit more like Peter did because Peter will write about some doctrine and then he'll apply it and he runs back to some doctrine and then he applies it and uh, Solomon kind of writes that way too he's just he kind of picks up a theme and then interrupts it to say this and then he goes back to a theme and interrupts it to say that and maybe he's not interrupting it maybe it's all a package deal which is one of the things we'll point out here in coming weeks it's almost like he's saying if you're going to have victory in the adultery immorality area you also have to have all this other stuff wisdom you have to have you know industriousness you have to have obedience and and on and on and, and, and so forth. True. So maybe that's where he's going with well, that. Well, I'm imagining also, and I don't know, maybe I'm taking creative license here, but I'm imagining that Solomon is teaching his son, and I, I would say he probably had more than one son with all of the wives and concubines that that man had. <laughs> But anyway, so I'm just imagining that he had just lessons that he wanted to share with his children, instruction, wisdom he wanted to give them. And so it's almost as if, as if each chapter is a lesson and he is teaching and sharing and illustrating. And then the next lesson, he's like, you know what? They didn't really get that. So I'm going to go back and <laughs> reiterate. Well, that, that's entirely possible. The Our whole kids are that way. lesson on wisdom or the whole lesson on keeping yourself pure. And oh, they still didn't get it. So they need a really, really big illustration here. <laughs> yeah. And yet it, it is true. Probably, although he had many children, it does appear that he is writing to one child. And so whatever's happening here, he does use the, the term son singular mm -hmm. over and over again. And when it comes to chapter three, which is where we're, we're jumping in here, when it comes to chapter three, our guess is that most people think of chapter three, they think of chapter three, five, and six. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Very and, powerful uh, verses. Absolutely. And so that's probably the main focus, but it seems to me there are at least several lessons we can learn in the chapter, and uh, let's just jump in and, and get those going. There does seem to be a lesson that we do need to continually be focused on the teaching and the training of truth. And that, I think, shows up in the idea there of him saying again, my son, in fact, he says it three times in this chapter, chapter three, verse one, verse 11, and verse 21. And uh, let's, just, uh, let's just look those up. Chapter three, verse one is, my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. And then in verse 11, he says, my son despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. And again, in verse 21, my son, let not them depart from thine eyes, keep sound wisdom and discretion. And there obviously is a theme running there, and we don't want to hammer that unnecessarily, but he does begin chapter one, and he points out early in chapter one in verse eight, when he says, my son, hear the instruction of thy father. He draws attention to that again in verse 10, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Later in chapter two, he starts chapter two with my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Of course, we just read the ones in chapter three, but uh, pretty, pretty quickly in chapter four, verse 10, hear, O my son, and receive my sayings and the years of thy life shall be many. Chapter five, there's another one in chapter four, but chapter five in verse one, what does that one say? He says, my son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. In fact, chapter six and chapter seven begin with the phrase, my son, my son. And in chapter six and verse 20, he mentions another one. What is that one? Chapter six, 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. So it does uh, remind us, moms and dads, you that are listening, that we do have to continually be focused on teaching and training truth. I suppose there's a sense in which we could say that all of this could have just happened in one day. 
Solomon sits down and in one day he says, my son, my son, my son. Although the Bible does tell us later that his Proverbs, the, the idea seems to be were brought together over a course of years, these wise sayings that he brought together. And so it is obvious that he's emphasizing that we have to continually do it. And one of the hardest things maybe to do as a parent is to be consistent in that. Life mm. is busy. Life yes. is distracting. There's so many things happening in our world that it's easy to forget the idea that we have to continually focus on the teaching and the training of God's truth to our children. And it is wise. One of the things that I was thinking about this week as I was thinking about the importance of my son is that when you go back to chapter one, Solomon does, and I don't know how far to take it, but Solomon does make a point in chapter one that there's a time when that it's, it, it's too late. And that's a serious thing for us to think about. Whereas we are responsible as parents to teach our children, to teach our sons and our daughters truth, he does very clearly state in chapter one that there comes a time when no longer is it available. And so, you know, I thought about it and, and the emphasis there is he's in chapter one is he's emphasizing wisdom, righteousness, and the fear of the Lord. And he said, because we failed in wisdom and we failed in righteousness and we failed in the fear of the Lord, then he will laugh when calamity comes. Mm-hmm. And, and although at that point you'll try to seek him really early, okay, I, I got to pick it up now. You know, things are hard. I got to pick it up that it's just too late. And, and I don't know how far to take that. When does it become too late? When does, you know, uh, I, I, there, there's so many questions that he leaves there, mm-hmm. but it is a reminder and maybe a really sobering challenge for us as moms and dads that we really do have to, as early as possible, teach our children to know truth, to think truth, to understand. Right. Yes. Because there can come a point, as parents, just in a reasonable sense, there comes a day when your training is done. True. So it's too late then to right. train them because they leave your home. They're leaving. But there also seems to come a time when if we're not willing to seek the truth, that it's too late to find the truth. And uh, what I do love about in chapter one, as I was going back and looking at it, is he's telling, uh, he's making a case that wisdom, righteousness, and the fear of the Lord are good. Those yes. are just wonderful things. In fact, he's pointing out that they're better. They're better than folly. And I've been studying ahead in this series. And in chapter nine, he's going to lay out uh, the uh, two opposites. You can either live by wisdom or live by folly. And uh, one is a mansion and one is a shack, and it's your choice. And, uh, but it's better. And, and, and I guess the point he's making there is that it's only available for a limited time. And too late, and this is what I thought about, too late is always a sad thing. You know, I got there too late. I, you know, we, we, we have been on airplanes recently where we didn't make it to a meeting because the planes right. were late. Or we missed and, our connection. Yeah, so it was too late. And, uh, you know, there's just always that, that, you know, that letdown. And it's like it's the end of the world when you're, you know, miss a plane or you have to, you know, you didn't make it in time for a meeting. But there's always just something. It's all of us hate being too late. And so uh, what a reminder for us that we should continually be focused on teaching and training truth. Let me just say to those of you who have grown children that you feel are not living wisely or not living by the word of God. Take heart. Don't don't sit there and take our words and be like, oh, well, it's just too late. (laughs) And so wisdom is going to laugh in the face of my child, which is what Proverbs chapter one says. But that's not that's not what we're saying, because we always know that with our Lord, nothing is impossible. And so you pray for those children and you love those adult children and you work on them when you can, like just sharing with them. But But it is a reminder to us who still have children in our home. There does come a time when you have let outside, if you have let outside influences, I should say that big word, if you've let those speak more to your children about cultural truth and not spoken into their lives about biblical truth, there will come a time where it will be very difficult for them to hear biblical truth because they, they're philosophy and their heart and their mind will be so shaped by worldly and cultural truth, which is not truth at all when compared to the Word of God. So you do need to just think, young parents, it's not too early to start teaching those Bible verses. I love the Awana program, or if you have a program that's kind of like that in your church, because it teaches children early, early, as early as like two and three, I think. They're starting to learn the Word of God. God. 
So putting that truth into your children and praying with your children from an early age, teaching them to seek the Lord, teaching them that church is a good thing, that we hear from the Word of God. Those are all wonderful things to start early and to keep up with throughout their growing up years so that you don't come to a place where you're just like, oh my goodness, uh, uh, wait, he's about to graduate high school. I haven't even talked to him about this. I need to talk to him. That's, that is probably a little bit too late. You need to start training early. Yes. Yeah, so the point there is train early, but for you that are, you know, maybe you have a teenager that you're concerned about. And Bethany and I really believe with all of our heart that when you are concerned about an area, when you're like, hmm, they're not doing well, things aren't, aren't going well here. I've got some concerns about my son or my daughter. That's a time to be drastic especially mm. if you realize I only have a year left or I have two years left or I only have about three more years. When you see that there's an issue, become become very, go overboard. And it's time to seek the Lord and pray, God, give me wisdom. And it may be time to make some really hard decisions. You know, if your kid's in a school where they're being damaged, it may be time to make a hard decision and pull them out of that school. It may be time to say, you know what? You are not driving the car. You've lost your privilege. Right. It may be time to say, I'm sorry, you've lost your phone. I'm taking your phone. Uh, there may be any number of, of drastic decisions you have to make. Our culture does not like drastic decisions. Mm. And, and we hate the pressure of that because we feel like, well, we're the bad person and our kid's really unhappy. And right. well, it's better for your teenager to be unhappy for a year and a half or six months or seven months to where things are really hard because you're working diligently to help them to find wisdom right. than to let them grow up and not be able to find it Absolutely. when they need it. So well, what, what we, lessons are here? These are incredible lessons. We do tend to, instead of uh, systematically making it a consistent part of our day where we just speak truth into our children. It's not something that's like, oh, wait, it's truth hour. Let's all sit down and, <laughs> and soak in some truth. We just, it's just a systematic thing where you're having a conversation and you're speaking truth. But usually if, if we get to a place where we have an older child and I'm talking about like a teenager who's still in your home and you know that they're not doing right. And what David said is very true. It's time to take some drastic measures that aren't just going to be hard on the teenager. They are going to be hard on everybody yes. to take those drastic measures. But I think in our, our world where we want everything so immediate, where we're just so used to, you know, we use the Keurig and we get coffee. We have it right now. We have mobile ordering where we can order from Starbucks and get there and just pull it up off the counter. We don't even have to order at the checkout. It's amazing. So we're just so used to everything to be so immediate and so fast that we want, if we have a child who is struggling, we want to, we want to sit down and we want to have a conversation and we want to be very stern and very firm. And we want that child to get up from that conversation and go, oh, you're right. I haven't been following truth. I need to follow truth. Instead of all of us buckling down and saying, you know what, we have some, some work to do. Mom and dad have work to do on ourselves and, and we're going to help you work on yourself. And at the end of this, all of us are going to be better. Absolutely. What it, and the reminder there is that uh, issues of wisdom and issues of the heart are never a mobile order. Right. <laughs> uh, wisdom of issue, or, you know, issues that involve the heart and that involve wisdom are, are matters that take time. Yes. And that's what Pro Proverbs chapter three is trying to show us that we have to be focused on teaching, training, and repeating yes. truth, teaching, training, repeating truth. And, and the second lesson, let's jump into the second one here, is that we have to be focused on seeking, finding, and living it. So we're teaching mm. it, we're training it. But the point is that you have to seek it, you have to find it, you have to live it. And, and as I see it, he lays out four ways to do that. The first one is in verse five, where he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Mm -hmm. The second one is in verse seven, where he says, fear the Lord. In verse nine, he says to honor the Lord. And the lesson I get from verse four, eight, 13, and 18 is enjoy the Lord. Okay. So let's, let's just walk through those briefly. Read for us verse five, because the point here is, if you're going to seek, find, and live truth, you have to do it by trusting in the Lord. Verse five says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. And then get verse seven there as well. He's, he's giving a second step. First one, trust the Lord. Number two, fear the Lord. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. And then verse nine. 
verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So we can trust in the Lord. We have to do that. We have to fear the Lord. We have to honor the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth our pointing out here because I see in the text that he's also reminding his son, you need to enjoy the Lord. For instance, verse 4. How does he see that in verse 4? So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. And then again in verse 8. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Verse 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. And then verse 18. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her. I, I think that's worth our pointing out because this is not some cold, sterile, oh my goodness, here's a way to live and the world thinks we're stupid and we're all foolish and we got to be strict and hard. No, it does involve trusting in the Lord and fearing the Lord and honoring the Lord. But all of that is couched here in chapter three with so you can enjoy the Lord. Right. You can be happy and blessed and favored. He uses incredible words there. Oh, yes. But it does go back to trusting in the Lord. And uh, that's been uh, been one of my favorite verses for a long time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Mm -hmm. Don't lean. You can't always figure it out, can't always understand it, but God has a plan. Right. And if we acknowledge him in all our ways, he will, he will direct our paths. And Bethley and I, one of the questions that Bethley and I get asked a lot, maybe more so me than Bethley, but the question does come up often, well, how'd you get started in your ministry? Hmm. How do you go to college as a kid from the mountains of East Tennessee? And how do you graduate? And a couple of years later, you are preaching revivals in local churches. How do you do that? And usually people ask me that because there's sometimes it's just they're incredulous. You know, like, okay, that's kind of a wow. How'd you do that? Sometimes it's because they want to do that themselves. You know, I'd like to get started. You did it. How, how can I get started? And sometimes just a curiosity. But really, I think the whole answer to all of that in our ministry has been trust in the Lord. And we're like, okay, God, we feel like you're calling us to serve local churches in the ministry, the field, the work of evangelism, the work of an evangelist. And uh, so we don't know how to do this. We've tried, try, you know, we've, we've studied, we've, we've prayed, we've prepared, uh, we're working at it. How do we do it? And the thing that God taught us is that we have to trust him. Okay, Lord, we're going to rest in you and we're going to depend on you. We're looking to you. And do you remember, you know, when we first got started, we were saying, okay, Lord, we'd like to have one meeting a month. Mm-hmm. And then later, okay, God, now that we have those, we want 12 or two meetings a month. And eventually we prayed for three meetings a month. And there was one year. Do you remember that one year when we had like 42 meetings? Because we said yes, yes to everything. Yes. If you invited us to come, uh, we, we didn't even check you out. We're just, okay, we're coming. And uh, <laughs> so we were willing to go and serve. And, and we ended up one year there where we had so many meetings that we were exhausted. We, we were. absolutely thought, what are we doing? And that's when we found counsel. Mm -hmm. And we got advice about how to wisely schedule. And uh, maybe as busy as we are lately, we need to review that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Wise scheduling. But the whole point is that the way you seek, find, and live truth is you do start out by trusting in the Lord. You can trust God with your marriage. You can trust God with your family. You can trust God with your ministry. And Bethany and I were super practical. Trusting in the Lord is not just, all right, whatever. No, we, we knew we had to make a living. So in the years when we did, or the weeks when we didn't have meetings, Bethy and I were substitute teachers in those days. Mm-hmm. Uh, I uh, did some roofing in those days. Uh, we worked to make ends meet. We, we paid bills. But at the same time, we were trusting God to lead us and guide us. And, and that's how we've raised our children. We've been very diligent. Uh, we have worked really hard to say we got to have devotions. We got to be in church. This is what we're going to do. This is we, we need. We can change this. Okay, we need to rethink that. It's been a whole huge work in progress, and we've had five kids to work on, and we're still working on that last one. Right. And yeah, but it's the whole the whole thing is couched in. Hey, look, God is good. Yes. And He wants to give you His favor, and He wants to give you His blessing. You mom and daddies, don't don't be scared to death about this. Trust in the Lord. What He says works. So we rested in Him and sought Him, and boy, did we see His provision. Absolutely. Uh, you know, he gave us the small apartment we first started, and then he provided an RV for us, two RVs, actually, two fifth wheels. and Not at the same time. At, not at the same time, but the first one, then we needed to replace it, so he gave it, you know, provided, I mean, we paid for it, but God, God ordered our steps. Yes. And we had an RV, and then we ended up buying a house, and that was a miracle. <laughs> yes. Just we trusted the Lord for that. So the point is trust in the Lord. Anything you would add? Any. Any thoughts there about trusting in the Lord? Well, I just, I love that it says, um, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not in your own understanding. So that, uh, that always reminds me, you know, you need to stop. 
I don't really like this term, but I'm going to use it. Stop freaking out about it, Bethley. It's going to be okay because if you just trust the Lord, he will direct your path. And I also love that you just acknowledge him. Sometimes you don't know what to say. You don't know what to pray. And you're just like, well, Lord, I'm acknowledging you. (laughs) So Lord Jesus, I'm just going to call on your name and you know what's going to happen here. I have no idea what to do. You can give us wisdom. And I trust that you will. And so, Lord, I just acknowledge you in this. And he does He does direct our path every single time. And he takes care of us every single time. You know, economically, things are weird in our culture right now. And I'm sure all of you are feeling that pinch. Um, when you go to the grocery store, you're just like, what in the world? I hardly have anything in my cart and I just paid a lot of money for it. And all of us are feeling that, but I just keep coming back to these verses and I keep saying, you know what, Lord, you have taken care of us for 30 some years, almost 31 years in this ministry, and you're not going to stop now. And so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to worry about finances. I'm not going to worry about children who are married and have to face some of the things they're facing and our grandchildren have to face some of the things philosophically, culturally, politically that they will face. I'm not going to worry about that because you have taken such good care of us and you can do that too, young parents. Just trust in the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to do and teach your children to trust in the Lord. And you older parents too and you older folks trust in the Lord. Yes. And just rest, probably the parallel verse to that in Philippians uh, would be in Philippians chapter four. Yes. And he says, be careful, be full of care for nothing, be right. anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What yes. a parallel to this. So we're to trust in the Lord and we're running out of time here, but we also need to fear the Lord. And uh, we have covered that in other podcasts, but to fear the Lord is to live with an awareness, with a reverence and an awareness of God and let that affect our lives. Fear the Lord, honor the Lord. It's one of the reasons that we give. We are aware of our finances, of living wisely with contentment, honoring the Lord with our our, our possessions. Yes. This house is his house. This RV is his, his RV. Yes. Our money belongs to him and we want to use it wisely. We want to be good stewards of everything God has given to us, honor the yes. Lord. Mm-hmm. But I love that. And I don't want to overlook this one, especially we need to remember that this is about enjoying the Lord. Right. And we want our kids to be favored. We want our kids to be happy. Mm. And what the Solomon is telling his son is, son, there's a lot of pain in the world. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of, you're going to have disappointments and difficulties and you're going to battle sin and struggle. But if you will seek and find and live truth, if you will let my wisdom direct your life, you can enjoy, you'll find my favor. You will find there's happiness in that. You will find it's a better way to live than what the world offers us. Well, there's so much peace in it. You don't have to scrape and, and come up with all of the the wisdom on your own. You can go to the Lord and he will direct you and there is peace and rest in that. And we don't have a lot of peace and rest in our world, but we as children of God can have a peaceful place. I love it that our house, (laughs) our house with the children all in it growing up, it was chaotic and loud and it was fun, but there was just always so much going on and it would sometimes puzzle me that neighborhood children always wanted to end up at our house instead of, hey, let's go to my house and play, you know, whatever. They wanted to come to our house. And I think part of it, and there were probably many, many reasons, but part of it was our house was a peaceful place. Yes, there was chaos. Yes, there was craziness. Yes, sometimes there was mess and, and all of that stuff. But our hearts were at peace and our relationships were at peace, and we were at peace with God. And I think that just is a wonderful testimony, and it's also just a wonderful place to be. Yeah, and we got along with each other, and there was love and, and joy. Yes. So uh, what a wonderful thing there. So here's here's the lessons we've learned in Chapter 3. We, we should continually be focused on the teaching and the training and the repeating of truth. Yes. And we should continually be focused on seeking, finding, and living the truth. Mm-hmm. And he, he sums that up in these four ways. Trust in the Lord, fear the Lord, honor the Lord, enjoy the Lord. But there's one more thing, Beth, and I want to point out as a lesson here. 
we should expect our homes to be blessed as a result. Mm. Read verse 33, because this is just a dynamite verse in chapter three. (laughs) Well, it starts out awesome. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. (laughs) That just sounds so, (laughs) uh, wow. Anyway, um, but the verse ends, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. You know, we won't deal with this thing about the curse of the Lord, but mm-hmm. sometimes that just is is not this, you know, weird, uh, you know, like there's a bolt of lightning about to hit on this house. Sometimes it's just the life they're living, reaping what they've sown is just, you've missed God's favor. The curse of the Lord may just be nothing more than God had a better plan and you didn't get it. Yeah. And now you're living this life without peace, without joy, without love, without happiness, without my favor, without my blessing. But he makes this point. Read that last half again. Would you verse 33, the last half? But he blesseth the habitation of the just. Now that's, that's where we want to close chapter three. We want to draw your attention. The word habitation is the dwelling or the home. He blesses the dwelling or the home of the just. The word bless uh, is the word that has the idea of, of praise, adoration. It even can mean the word salute. He mm. blesses it. He salutes the home of the just. He, mm. he adores the home of the just. And, yes. and he praises the home of the just. It made me think of the story of Job. When Satan, Satan goes to heaven to make accusations against Job, mm-hmm. one of the things he says that, that I have underlined in several of my Bibles is Satan said to God, you know, I know why Job serves you. It's because you have made a hedge about him and his family. You put this protection around him. And and in our culture almost has this idea that like, you know, well, you just, you just can't expect, you, you know, you just, there's just no guarantees. You just can't expect things to be well in your home. And, uh, you know, may, maybe try, but good luck. There's a real mm. pessimism about the family, yes. even in the church. Yes. And yet, dear friends, if you're listening today and you have a family, can I just remind you, based on what Solomon is saying here, is that when you and I seek God for wisdom and for truth, when we seek to live and embrace truth, what he says here is true. Yes. And he said he wants to bless your habitation, your dwelling place, your home. And there's not a thing wrong with you expecting God to put a hedge around your family. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with you expecting that if we do this, our family is going to be well. Right. If we do this, it's worth it. It's better. Yes. And obviously we live in a sin cursed world. Obviously we make decisions. Obviously we struggle. There's going to be valleys. There's going to be hurts. There's going to be pain. There's going to be difficulties. But the point he's making here is that this way of living is better. Yes. And it's far better than any other way to live. And so Belty and I just want to close this chapter by challenging you. You young parents believe this, that if you'll teach and train and succeed here, your habitation will be blessed. And you that are getting older, you got teenagers, keep up with it. Keep trying. Don't give up. Don't stop. If your kids are grown and not well, pray up a storm for them. If you're praying, God is working. Mm -hmm. Uh, Love them and make sure they know that. And, and keep the doors of communication open. You can be honest. You know, I don't like how you're living. This is wrong, but I love you. And I'm still, I'm still your dad. I'm still on your side. I still care about you. You're always welcome in my house. Work at these things because the, 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 blessings, uh, the blessings of God are on the habitation of the just. Yes. And what a powerful way. One final thought from you before we close off today. Well, the very last verse of Proverbs chapter 3 begins with this. The wise shall inherit glory. So I just feel like that's just another promise of if we practice biblical wisdom, there will be glory. That's excellence. That is actually a crown. It's like a, a, an award crown yes. given to people. There will be glory on our lives. It's not like, oh, you name it and claim it. It's not that at all. It's just that we walk with God and there is a blessing in walking with God. Absolutely. And on that note, we'll land right there. Thanks for joining us today here at the Keeping It Young podcast. Reach out to us if we can help you, if we can serve you, if we can be a blessing to you, we would be glad to do so. I hope you have a great day. Remember to serve the Lord with gladness. The Keeping It Young podcast is a Bax 5 Media production.